Good morning and welcome to my second talk in this conference about contemporary C++ in action. I will tell you about an experiment that I've been doing in the last couple of months, the motivation about it, and I will give you a demo and my conclusion about the outcome of this experiment. As I said yesterday, I'm an electrical engineer and quite long into software development, and I'm also um, doing some kind of stuff on the committee, even though I'm no longer an official member of it. So, the motivation behind this talk. Every time I go to social media and on the web, there are some people who are really vocal about what is the current state of C++ and they have pretty strong opinions about it. C++ is dead. The committee is only about the nerds. It's only doing stuff for the library writers. It's slow and it doesn't deliver anything useful. It's too fast, I can't keep up with all the com stuff and all what's coming out is just half done. Maybe 10 years more and give us the real stuff then. Or even more outspoken opinions about what the committee is doing. And some people say, oh, this new fancy stuff, just syntactic sugar, forget about it. But is this really true? Yeah, so I decided let's do a reality check. As I said, I'm quite experienced in software development, but what can I do to do some kind of a real life test? How would it feel for maybe a newcomer to C++ to actually deal with C++, what C++ has to offer? So I decided C++23 is probably a good time to conduct such a test. There are so many new library features that I can use that I've never been using before. And I can try as many of the new core language features. And there are a ton of libraries out there that I've never been exposed to. So let's use all of this kind of stuff and implement something non-trivial and do it and show it here. And I had a very short of time because I was committing to giving such kind of a talk two months before I had to present it at C++ on C. So I don't have that much time to make it happen. So if C++ is really that hard to use with something that you are not experienced with, this experiment should fail. So this is the reason why I came up with the title of this talk, Contemporary C++ in Action. So what does contemporary mean in this context? Is it the old and trusted C++ 98 and C++ 03? Well, at least partially because it's the fabric of our language. Or is it the Renaissance C++11 or C++14? Yeah, probably yes. Or is it all the new parts and, and additions to C++ that came with C++17? We had all the new uh, vo vocabulary types, optional, variant, and, and whatnot, that can put into good use. And maybe this is what should be considered contemporary C++. Or is it the new stuff from C++20 and C++23? I think this change that has been coming with C++20 is so huge, it's a completely new language in my opinion. I think it's all of that as long as it has stood the test of time. Obviously, the newer kind of stuff is probably 
more expressive and can be probably easier be used, but the old stuff is still relevant today. And the second part of the title, what does in action mean here? As I said, I'm an engineer and this demo application should not be trivial, but should contain everything that I do every day in my daily work as an engineer. It should do data collection, it should do data processing, it should do data visualization, it should do a little bit of near real-time networking, it should do library usage, library creation, it should do a little bit of interface design, and it can take anything that's needed to make all of this happen. So I came up with an idea what I could actually do within this time frame, and this is the specification of the code. It will have a server part, it will have a client part, and it will be a complete application. The server will wait for a client connection to come in, and it will observe a directory for TIFF files that contain videos. And it should uh, go over all the contents of the directory over and over again endlessly, as long as the uh, spectator is interested in seeing these videos. It should decode all these files into individual frames and send these video frames over the network to the client. The client will then present the decoded video frames in a window on the screen. And as I said, I'm in an industrial setting. I require clean shutdowns and handling of errors in the networking connections, not just the application go away without any cleanup. So I decided which libraries can I do to make this happen. As I said, it should at best be something that is coming out of the committee work. And as I told yesterday, we have no networking library in the standard itself but we have the networking TS, and there's a reference implementation of it, the ASIO library. Maybe some of you are familiar with it. Is anybody of you familiar with ASIO? Has it used any? Okay. What's your opinion on the usability of this library? Exactly. So, it does not only the networking, in particular asynchronous networking, but it's also an asynchronous execution framework. And this makes it really interesting. The second library is the libav library, better known under the FFmpeg tools, which are using this library, and this is extremely popular with decoding and handling um, audio and video formats. And the best part about libav is I have no clue about it. The same with SDL. It's an open source library for um, doing multimedia I.O., like uh, outputting 3D stuff and 2D stuff and, and media stuff to the loudspeakers and to, to video. And it does a little bit of window handling. And the best part of it, it's really simple. So I could think, yeah, this is maybe something that I can use in this experiment. Both libav and SDL are C libraries, not C++ libraries. And I also reached out into our company code base for very simple, basic, supportive stuff like uh, option passing from the command line. I don't like to invent reinvent the wheels over and over again. So, this code will have 
C23 in it because I require new stuff that I'm not familiar with. And it totally re relies on C20. And yeah, maybe some of you are not too happy about compile time programming. A little bit of it is in there. You probably should learn a bit of compile time programming these days. Yeah. About the, the conventions I'm using here, I don't have all these uh, namespace kind of things on every slide. It's just too much. Assume all these namespaces shown here are present. And this is a cultural thing. Everything that denames, uh, denotes a thing starts with a capital letter and uh, things of type kind have a small prefix. Then, yeah, you can read it, what these particular kind of things are designated with. So let's start with the first part of the code, the video handling. There is a section of code where I wrap these C types from the libav library into proper C++ types, which have constructors and destructors. But besides that, it handles all the, the value semantics that we expect as C++ developers from these types like this AV codec context that I have given the name codec in the end. And so you can use all these C types just like you handle C++ value types. And it also handles the uniqueness of all these objects that are created within the factory functions of the libav library. This applies to codecs, this applies to the files, the file notion of libav regarding um, multimedia files and also in the decoding process, we have packets and frames. Yeah, packets and frames um, are never empty, whereas the other types can be empty, and they are also reference counted. So I have some, some support functions in here just to make sure that at the end of a scope, the reference counts will be dropped. Then I will define a frame header that I will going to use. It has a couple of properties, pretty much what you would expect from a video frame, some predicates that you can apply them just to classify if it's a, actually a valid video frame or if it's uh, just a filler or whatever it might be, if it's the first frame in a sequence, this stuff like that. And most importantly, there is this uh, guarantee that this particular structure is trivial enough to be bit blasted. Bit blasted means I can take the bits, move it somewhere else, and the value of this uh, aggregate still is the same. So I can send it over the network and it just con uh, retains the, the complete um, semantics that it's um, designating. Then there's a type that is designates a bunch of video pixels and it's implemented as a span of bytes and both the header and the pixels make up a complete video frame. There's a constructor that is required to send filler frames because if you don't have anything to show, it should still sense a little bit over the network and you can say how much of time a filler frame should designate. And there is a full constructor from a decoded video frame with some metadata. And this is where you, we can use these designated initializers of aggregate, aggregates to make it absolutely clear what we are going to intend by 
um, filling in all the header parts of the video frame. I think this is even better than the regular constructors are. The same with the pixels. I, this is just a view into the decoded uh, pixels from the libav frame that's returned from the decoder. And here is the meat of the whole video decoding process. It's a function called make frames. It takes a directory that is going to be observed. And the return type is this new C23 kind of thing called std generator, which means with this return type, I can express endless sequences of decoded video frames. It's iterable, it's a range, and every time you want to get a new video frame decoded from this function, it will um, do whatever is required to come up with a new video frame. What's behind this generator kind of thing is a coroutine that runs until it can produce a new video frame. And the whole decoding process starts out with something that generates an endless stream of paths. And it does that by an infinite directory iterator. This is sim very similar to the file system directory iterator. The difference is it does it over and over and over again endlessly. So you have an infinite range, an infinite sequence of kind of things. This is something that you usually cannot handle without any sort of lazy evaluation of things. This endless stream of paths is then put into a view pipeline from the C++20 library. And the first step is filtering the paths if they have the required extension .gif. The second part is transform these paths into these um, libav file objects that I've been showing before by trying to open the given path as a GIF file. And there's another transformation step in here that takes an already opened libav file and tries to associate it with a video decoder that can handle the contents of this video file. At the end of the transformation pipeline, we will get pairs of an open file and an open decoder, or even if there is nothing in there, you can also have um, just empty files and decoders here at the stage. And this is the output from this pre-processed media files. If we actually have a decoder that can handle a given file, we will put a little bit of logging onto the terminal using this new C++23 formatted console output here. And then we yield the decoded video frames one after the other from all the video frames that will be generated by the actual decoding done by the libav library. This decode frames is also a coroutine. And so I'm actually um, nesting one coroutine, one generator into another coroutine and generator here. This decode frames takes our opened files and our open decoder. And if we don't have a valid decoder and we don't have a valid file, we just send out filler frames worth of 100 milliseconds of blackness. The first filter that I've been showing was this has extension kind of thing. It's just um, a wrapper around a 
um, lambda expression, the second part is the first um, decoding stage is this try open a file as a GIF. It takes a path and it will return a libav file. And yeah, this is more or less a cookbook implementation of the, the libav stuff, but expressed as proper C++. So here in this, this case, the, I cannot use the, uh, a regular constructor because the underlying libav file, uh, libav function returns a value about success or a failure of this opening process. So I cannot put it into a, um, into a constructor because you can return any return values from a constructor and throwing exceptions is not an option here because we want to be handling stuff endlessly. And if we successfully have opened such a file, we will have to check if the contents is actually a TIFF file and we only accept TIFF content here. And this takes such a file and will also return such a file and it will check if the content has a video type as con media content and if the content is actually a TIFF. This is done by another function from the library. library. If this is not the case, we will just drop the open file on the floor and go along. Otherwise, we can try to open a video decoder. This will take a file and will return this pair that I've been talking about before. But at this stage, we can figure out if the content of this uh, file is actually a video stream or if it is just a still video. Most two files are just still video, but I can uh, also encode video sequences. Yeah, if we can actually open successfully an, an video decoder for the contents, we pass out this ready to decode pair of file and decoder. And here's the heart of the decoding process. We take the file, we take the decoder, and as I said before, we will return a generator which will produce one video frame after the other on each iterated step. Yeah, this, the rest of the stuff is more or less uh, textbook video decoding 101. As long as we're not at the end of the file and we can successfully read the data from the from the file and get packets out of the reading process, the, then can send it to the decoder and try to get a decoded video frame out of the decoder. And if this decoding is actually successful, we can create a video frame and yield it as the next output of this range. This implementation here is more or less what you can find on maybe um, the internet in, in Stack Overflow or such kind of things. It will look similar, but much more complicated because all this stuff is implemented in C where you have to manually handle all the creation of the necessary assets and the destruction of the necessary assets and the the handling of the reference counts and all this kind of stuff. And none of this is seen here because I could wrap it into proper C++ objects. And even more importantly, I don't have to do all the necessary hoops, uh, how to return something from the inner, the, the, the most nested loop to the outside, because this is the the biggest problem in decoding, you're at the deepest nesting level of loops where you actually create the stuff and want to return it to the caller. And with these generators, this is now extremely simple to do. Just put a code CO yield here and you're done. Otherwise, you would probably have to depend dependency inject like a function object or do it with some kind of template parameter. 
None of this is necessary here. This um, directory iterator is just a wrapped uh, file system. Directory iterator, you have all the boilerplate that you need to do with iterators. And the interesting part here is the sentinel kind of type because um, together with this equality operator where you can compare the iterator with the sentinel type returning false gives you an iterator that will never stop. You can iterate endlessly over the kind of thing. And it will, in, in difference to the, to the file system, directory iterator return directly a path. And this is the most important kind of thing here. If you happen to have a, an iterator, you can turn it, every iterator into a range by applying non-member functions called begin and end, which return the correctly initialized iterators or iterator sentinel pairs to make range-based forms and, and ranges work together with your type. If you happen to have such a iterator type in your company code base, just augment it with these two kinds of functions and you have actually something that you can iterate on using the ranges libraries. So we can assert that this is a valid range and it's also a valid viewable range. Let's come to the next part. I'm not sure if any everybody of you is aware of the differences between synchronous networking and asynchronous networking. Synchronous networking, you start the operation, maybe a socket read, then you block your current thread and wait for the result. This is actually the fastest thing you can do with networking because you still hold on to the thread, the caches are hot, this is the fastest kind of thing. In contrary to many people believe asynchronous networking is faster than synchronous. No, this is not the case. The asynchronous kind of operation is shown on the bottom half of the picture here. You initiate the actual operation then the operating system will perform the operation and sometime later it will come up with the outcome of this operation, but it has to store it away until something from your execution framework will actually take care of the outcome. So there's a little bit kind of latency in there that's absolutely normal in asynchronous operation, but the, the, the whole benefit is in the fact that you don't block the resources. You can do something more useful with the, the same execution agents you're running on. So this is typically a kind of a callback. It can execute on the same thread that has been initiating the operation or it in most cases on a different kind of thread or execution agent or whatever it might be. You need to be aware of this kind of fact. So in an industrial setting, you don't do just a socket read or something like that. You have to handle um, something like a timeout. For example, if your network connection goes down and you don't be notified about it, you need to have some uh, something that will end the operation. And usually this is done by a timer. So. What we do in our company is we associate a, so a socket and a timer as, as a kind of thing that you have to use uh, um, at the same time. The problem is if you initiate these two asynchronous operations at the same time, you have to hold on to this kind of object until the last callback is returned from the operating system. And as I said, the callbacks may come on the same thread, but they also may come from different threads. 
So now you have the situation that you have kind of a, a shared lifetime of your objects. And the updates coming in from the operating system may come concurrently, so you have to be sure that you don't have a, a race condition in there, and usually you um, handle this kind of stuff using some kind of state machines. And state machines are typically not that easy to do, in particular if they are distributed about uh, across different threads or uh, different parts of your code. And ACO library is quite famous for this kind of code, where you have your state machine distributed and scattered across many, many functions. And even more complicated, there may be situations that you're no longer interested in the outcome of such an operation. So you have a third party involved here that can say, okay, I'm done, drop everything on the floor. So if this is a really complicated connection of dependencies that are going on here. You have this thing with the, the first reference coming from the initiator, then you have the initiating functions to do the socket read and the timer start, and you have then to handle on the, all the deferred, the, these three references to the thing, to the completion callbacks, and depending on which of the first, which of the completions come in first, you have to make sure that the operations there are executed in the correct order and do stop the other um, still running operation by canceling them in the correct result and you have to determine the composed result. This network of dependencies and, and um, shared pointers in most cases is not easy to handle in particular if you're going to use them on different threads. And with the later versions of ACO, you can now go on and compose coroutines out of all of these uh, initiating functions like asynchronous read, asynchronous write, asynchronous accept. And so you no longer get callbacks, but you get awaitables out of these functions from ACO. And even better, you can compose them using operators provided by the ACO library. So in the middle part, you see this operator with these parallel lines. This should show that these two operations are running in parallel. And the outcome of the, this operator is also returning an available that you can use to then co-await the composed operation. And if you look later on the, on the implementation of this kind of thing in your um, user side code, this is extremely simple to handle. All of the difficult kind of things are abstracted away. And this is the reason why Chris Kornhoff, who is the author of the ICO library, is calling C++20 as the awesomest language for network programming because of coroutines and this composition that comes with it. So here's the networking part. I want to get tuples as the results from these functions, not and call back with two different separate types, but I want to get a tuple out of it. And I want to make sure that these tuples are wrapped in, in, into an available. And with that, I can say, okay, my sockets should be um, 
modulated in such kind of thing that uh, all of them return these availables, availables of tuples. This applies to sockets, acceptors, and timers. I also have a function which takes any kind of object and demotes it into a bunch of bytes. This is the object rep representation of these objects to send it over the network. And what I really want to get out of my functions here in the networking layer is I want expected as a return type. The, um, the error type should be the same as it's, what, as it's being returned from AZ, which is a std error code, and the value type in the success for, um, case is just what it's going to be returned from the ACO. This may be the size of the amount of data that has been transferred so far, or it may be a socket. And as I said, we are going to use this composed operator here so that you can see if you want to um, have an operation that sends data out to a socket using a um, a time budget and uh, an amount of buffers, then it will return this available of this expected kind of return type. And the whole operation is just a core weight of the asynchronous write to the socket in parallel to the timer weight. And this is all what's required here. If you as I said before, this is a huge improvement in comparison to what you have been doing before with ACU and asynchronous networking because of this composition power of coroutines and awaitables. The same with receiving from a socket. And what I'm showing here is also you I transform the, the, the variants that are coming back from the composed operation into a singular expected types here. And same with connect to, but in this case, I'm going to return a fully connected socket to the output after all the connection operation is done. I also have to have a compose close operation because um, closing sockets is a little bit more involved than just a member function call. So this transformation from the variant that's going to be returned from the parallel operation, um, the variant has either the outcome from the first asynchronous initiation or the outcome of the second asynchronous initiation. And I have to figure out what the actual return type is. It's only one type. And so as soon as I know what the actual return type will be, probably the size or even the, the socket. I can visit the variant with a polymorphic lambda, which will return this expected return type by calling a function template called map. This will take one of the tuples shown before, and if there happen to be no other types other than the, the um, error code, maybe in case of timers, you don't have an actual value to have only the return type of telling you have a timeout or if the, if the um, timer operation was canceled, you only have to return the unexpected part of the um, expected type here or if you happen to get an error code from maybe a socket read, you also put it through the error channel of the expected, or in all other cases, you can ret actually return an expected return type like size or the socket. The replacement is similar. Disappointments are forwarded and um, the the, um, the output of the composed operation is replaced by whatever I want to get out of it. There's also another function to resolve server names to endpoints, also with a time budget, but this is not so important here. 
which brings me to the asynchronous execution framework. And with it comes the notion of executed. I want to go too much into detail here, but what you see, long time ago, we only were running on, on the hardware. We had probably just one thread. This was inter implemented in hardware. Next, we had the abstraction of OS threads and STUD threads, where you can have as many as you like to. So the actual hardware is abstracted from. And you can also, in the next step, abstract from the uh, actual execution instance. You have maybe thread pools, you maybe have fibers. And then another um, abstraction layer on top of that is if you add policies to this kind of things. So you no longer handle individual threads, but you say, I need a thread or execution agent that has this particular kind of properties, that has this particular kind of quality of service. For example, how long would it take until the, um, the asynchronous operations will actually be handled? And ACO is adding another layer on top of it. This is the the, uh, the services that come with such a executor. ACU has so-called I.O. context, and this, these contexts are given as a service like, I can actually schedule I.O. operations on these kind of executors such that the, the framework will handle the completion that are coming back from the operating system. On Windows, these are I.O. completion ports. I don't know what the counterpart on Linux might be. There are probably more than one. But all of this is abstracted away and implemented by the services that the SEO execution context is providing to us. And the most interesting thing here is these services are user extensible. So you can take advantage of it. You can add your own service to these execution contexts. So what I did, I um, wrap the standard stop source and stop tokens into new names. One is off switch. It has a member function stop that you can actually use to stop execution and it has a Boolean operator and it can return implicitly into a stop indicator, which is a stop token. I want this implicit conversion here on purpose. And Björn is not here, so he can't complain. <laughs> so with these two kind of classes here, I'm ready to, to have this um, necessary operation that I've been showing before. If you're no longer interested in the outcome of an asynchronous operation, you can use these kind of things to, to indicate that you're no longer interested in the outcome. And I wrap it into a stop service. And the stop service is just holding on to such kind of an off switch. And I can then add this stop service to an IO completion context or any execution context. And I can get it out again. And I can ask any object that is related to such a execution context, give me the, the uh, off switch that's baked into the execution context by yeah, call this function get stop and give me the context to a given object. And how do I do that? For every object that I can get here, I can ask, is it an execution context already? This is done at compile time. Then I can just return it. If it's an executor, I can ask it for the context. And if it's an object that has an executor, I just call it for the executor and get the context out of it. And if the object is completely unrelated to this execution framework, I throw up my hands into the air and say, okay, this wouldn't work. 
please be aware this if else letter is done at compile time. It's only one of the branches that is executed and generating code. Then I have a function that can invoke asynchronous uh, operations here and it using um, a compile time predicate if it's actually asynchronously callable with this piece of work and these particular arguments. And if so, I can actually commission this kind of work onto the executor given here. And then if there happen to be an exception thrown by executing this piece of work, I want to stop the, the whole operation of the application. I will skip this particular part of the talk because this is a little bit too much compile time at, or pretty too much lava as Patricia would call it because what I'm doing here is a compile time function that will actually tell me if, if a callable plus a set of arguments is actually callable synchronously or asynchronously. So in the end, I can compose a scheduler by taking an execution context and a stop source. And the stop source is then imbued into the context and oh man. I will get a uh, a function object that can be used to schedule either synchronously or asynchronously the actual work. Lastly, I have this guard. The guard is used to to listen to all the to this uh, stop tokens and stop sources, and it will handle the closing of all the objects that are related to this operation here in the, in the coroutine. This is done by a fold over all the close operations that are, that are um, related to the given objects. And here I have an abstraction as um, as Kate was telling us yesterday here, if I have a, a piece of a fragment of work called X, and I have uh, asked the compiler, if I take, give you a kind of any kind of object and this particular code fragment, can you actually do something with it? And if you do, then execute it. And so I can ask the object if it can call a close, a free function close, or can a member function close, or can I call a cancel operation in it. And so I can make sure that uh, the, um, the asynchronous operation is canceled. So the server, I have to be very quick now. It takes a context, endpoints, and a source. And for each endpoint, it will start an, accept, an acceptor. And then the acceptor will take up the source and return an available. And here you see the, the guard for the first time. Whenever the stop token is, is fired from anywhere else in the application, it will close the acceptor here. As long as the acceptor is open, it will wait for incoming connections and commission a new connection using um, the socket and the source and will begin starting streaming videos. The streaming videos is another independent coroutine. It will take the socket and the timer and the sentinel once again, and it will take the video frames that have been showing at the output from the video command, uh, video decode pipeline, and each frame will then be weighted upon, upon and when it's actually the time to send out this particular frame. 
And after we call wait of this uh, this uh, timeout, it will try to send the video frames to this given socket. And if it's actually successful, it will proceed. Otherwise, it will break and stop the whole operation here. This is uh, the starting gate. This is not that much interesting here. What I've set up so far is a stage where I have acceptors, connections, and these are independently running actors on this particular stage. The client side is pretty much the same. I have a function called show me the videos, and this is an individual coroutine acting on the same execution framework. It will try to connect to our server, and then if this uh, connection is successful, it will pass on all the assets so far and start playing the video. And at the end, it will stop the application. This playing of videos, it takes the sockets and all the necessary assets here. It also has a memory resource to, to receive all the video pixels in here. And as long as the socket is open, it will receive video frames from the networking connection. If there is a well-formed frame, it will try to update the GUI and present the video pixels in here. And it will also log to the console. To receive a single video frame, it may be either a well-formed video frame with visible content, or it may be uh, may have um, no content at all, or it may be a malformed video frame. To receive is, yeah, if you get get the header into a bunch of bytes that is exactly aligned and has the correct size here. Receive it, try to figure out how many um, bytes are received, if it's actually a correct video header, and then you can put the, the object representation, the bytes that have come over the network into an actual um, alive object by displacement new, then ask for enough memory to receive the pixels, and if we get enough pixels and the correct amount of data, then we can form a video frame out of it and return it. Okay, the adaptive memory source is less interesting. The GUI is just, as the libav is, it's just a wrapped uh, STL objects, a video, a renderer, and a texture type. It has a class called fancy window, with a constructor um, and method to update the dimensions and the properties of the video um, window to, to match the properties of the frame handler. This is uh, probably what you would expect, width size, pixel width, source format, all this kind of stuff. And in the update, yeah, you try to figure out what the actual dimensions are that are coming in from the network, create a texture out of it, and show the window. And to present the pixels is, yeah, to be locked the texture, blast the pixels out to the texture on the video memory, and present it in the end. Yeah, we also had um, user interactions like mouse moves and this kind of stuff. We also handle um, signals from the terminal, like a uh, SIG term or a SIG interrupt. And we can also handle the GUI um, signals, like um, if you close the window, the application should stop. This is what's going on here by polling the event loop of the GUI window. So in the end, I get my command line parameters like the media directory and the server name, then try to figure out the endpoints, create my execution context and the stop source and make a scheduler out of it. And then I start the server on top of this execution context. And if this is successful, I can actually start trying to connect 
to my server here and begin showing the videos. Same, I can handle events from the terminal and I can handle events from the GUI. So this is then the setup that the application is actually running. We have the acceptors, we have the connection, we have the video player, we have the terminal events and we have the GUI events and we have the stop source baked into this execution frameworks. And each of these parts is operating independently of all others, implemented as a coroutine. Everything is wrapped within a coroutine, so nobody can have access to all the assets that are within each coroutine. A coroutine is just a function, so nobody can interfere without uh, with all the assets that they are holding on here. And I won't go into detail here. Everything I'm showing here is implemented with modules. Last year, I've been giving a talk about how to compose modules. If you look at the source code, this will be, or it already is up on GitHub, you can actually study how to compose modules with the current state of implementation in compilers. I have six in-project named modules, and oh, I have one header unit. I have four named modules made out of these libraries I've been talking about, and all of these uh, third-party libraries and the standard libraries are pre-compiled, so you compile it only once and reuse it. This is just a showcase of all the module types that you can have in C++20. I've shown this same picture last year, so I won't go into detail here. Yeah, this is, this is too much detail now. But I want to, uh, to show that actually using the standard library as a module is really, really fast. If you want to include all of the standard library, it takes on my machine two seconds just to provide all the interfaces. And if I do it using modules, I'm down to 15 milliseconds maybe even less. So I think this is a huge progress that they've been getting out of C++23. So let me head over to the demo code. Let's try to run this. Hmm. What's going on here? I have one console output says I've connected to IPv6 local loopback and one to IPv4, uh, version 4, but nothing happens. Has anybody an idea what's missing? Yeah, what's missing is I've only set up the scene so far, but I didn't have the missing piece from the director for the actors to actually do anything, which is Let's compile it again. Start it. And let's see if anything will happen.
So, how many frets do we have here? One. Most of the abstractions are done with coroutines and functions. How many classes did I implement? Except for the facades using the stop source and the, and the, the stop token? One. It's the GUI window. Now you see the power of coroutines, free functions, and asynchronous computing. And I think the code was quite easy to follow through. Everything composed well, and I actually managed it in this short amount of time using all the completely new libraries and language and library features. So I think C++ in its current stage is really powerful, safe, because everything is contained in functions. It's concise. And I think it's really joy to use modern, contemporary C++, in particular if you compare it to where we have been 20 years ago. So I can encourage all of you, try to get used to C++ 20, C++ 23, and try to bake everything into the best abstraction you can find so that the code becomes readable and also it becomes safe. So this is my conclusion about the experiment, and I think it went well. What do you think? <laughs>